Hi, I'm Steve Arbano. Welcome to another remote edition of our program. It is our honor to welcome our good friend. Last time she was in the studio, back by popular demand, Paula Francisi is uh, the Peter W. Rodino Professor of Law and Director of the Leadership Fellows Program at Seton Hall University Law School. Good to see you, Professor. Wonderful to see you, Steve. Uh, not many people know more about the judiciary, about the Supreme Court, than you do. Question. Before we talk about the larger issues of the Supreme Court, we're taping on the 1st of October. A lot of things are going to happen before this is seen. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 27 years on the court, the second woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Her greatest impact will be, oh. has been? Her radical project, in her words, that it was more than the law, it would be society that would come to perceive women and men as equal. If she hadn't done that, Paula, do you believe it would have been done at all or at a different pace? At, certainly at a different pace and with a, a different framing and conceptualization, Justice Ginsburg was supremely effective first as a litigator, as an advocate for all of us, for the public interest, for the societal interest in gender equality. And then as a jurist, what's interesting to me is that she began her career on the bench and I don't like labels, but if we did have to ascribe a label, she was more of a centrist. And it hmm. was only as the court shifted uh, significantly to the right that she became known as its most vociferous dissenter, the notorious RBG. That's right. You know, it's so interesting, Paula. You mentioned, you mentioned shifting the right, progressive, liberal left. Larger question. As we do this program, there's a presidential election going on. There will be a, either a new president or Donald Trump will remain president. There'll be another member of the Supreme Court. It could be um, the nominee as we speak right now. We don't know. But here's the question that I keep asking myself. Is it the role of the court to be a policymaker or to be an interpreter of the Constitution and the law, which has a lot of people confused and concerned right now. The court is by design, constitutional design, not the popularly elected branch. It is the role of the coordinating branches, the executive and legislative, to do the will of the people with enactment, legislative and through executive orders. The court is charged with interpreting the Constitution, but invariably in so many matters, there is involved a mix of individual and collective interests. Think about Brown versus Board of Education. Right. Uh, think about the, the, the quest for equality along all metrics. The court is oftentimes a catalyst for a, a change in a less than equal society and often a mirror, mirroring back to we the people, the changing norms, our changing culture. Yeah, but what's interesting, you mentioned Brown versus the Board of Education, I believe, uh, Topeka in 1954. It was Justice Thurgood Marshall who argued the case before he was a uh, justice, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then what's so interesting is that Justice Ginsburg winds up arguing before the Supreme Court before she is put on the Supreme Court. But the question becomes, if in fact it reflects, if the court is supposed to reflect the public and the court shifts more to the right, my question becomes, does that truly reflect the will of the people or the will of this particular president at this particular time with this particular Senate at this particular time, which is a different thing? Yeah, so it's, it's a wonderful and vitally important question for all of us in a participatory democracy. We would hope that 
a court, any court, would transcend the furies of a particular moment politically in time. Uh, and the court actually has, has surprised us over time by defying the labels and defying the expectations. Just this past term, we found that the center held as a consequence, a surprise mm. to some pundits, of the judicial branch. We had all sorts of unexpected ideological alliances involving justices presumed to be to the left and to the right. Because they agreed on the law, apparently. Yeah, because of, I think, two important guiding precepts. Uh, one is the value of what's called stare decisis. That's the norm that would uphold and honor the value of precedent in the law, that precedent matters, uh, lest the court erode its legitimacy and its authority. And, and the second has to do with uh, the court, as Chief Justice Roberts has, has often said, uh, calling the strikes and calling the balls, right. uh, deciding with, a, with a, a certain, we would hope, impartiality that would transcend, again, so many of the ideological fervors, particularly of this very polarizing time. Okay, so let me follow up on this. By the way, if you're listening on the audio side, Steve Adubato here with our good friend from Seton Hall University Law School, Professor Paula Francisi. Um, Professor, how about this? Amy Coney Barrett, her position on Roe, uh, Roe v. Wade, Ro Wade is very clear. The president, as we speak, President Trump, has made it very clear that where he is on that. Mitch McConnell has made it very clear where he is on that. Is it relevant to be asking nominees to the Supreme Court about their views on these issues, whether it's Roe v. Wade, whether it's the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare? Is that relevant beforehand if, in fact, they are there to interpret the Constitution and the law? I don't know that Judge Barrett's positions on some of the lightning rod touchstone issues, including those you mentioned, is actually all that clear, huh. mindful that her service on the U.S. Supreme Court is, is different from any commentary she would have provided previously as an, as an esteemed scholar, as uh, a very, very fine educator named three time professor of the year by the students who hold her in such high esteem. At Notre Dame? Yeah. And what I. So what I, hold on one second, Paul. Are you saying that what one says in commentary, what one may say in another venue, as soon as they put on those robes and sit as an associate justice of the United States Supreme Court, where you stand may depend upon where you, in fact, sit? It, it depends on the totality of the record that is brought before the court. Uh, judges, justices, we would hope are able to transcend whatever their personal beliefs hmm. might be in order to do right, in order to do what is just, in order to do what is honorable, given the entirety of the record before the court. Yeah. You know, the other thing, and again, we don't know how this is going to play out. We don't know who's going to win this election for president. But if, assume for a second, and in the first presidential debate, which we will not discuss, um, people can decide for themselves. Joe Biden was asked several times by Chris Wallace about the, quote, packing of the Supreme Court, which was attempted, if I'm not mistaken, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and he was pushed back on that. Nine justices of the Supreme Court. Biden never answered that question by the time this airs. He may, will answer, may answer it publicly. Here's the question. What are the implications of potentially going from nine justices to 12 or 15? Because Democrats at some point may believe, you know something? We need to bal balance this out ideologically, you say? It is not a good idea from my vantage point. We know that it failed miserably in 1937 when FDR endeavored to pack the court in order to assure passage of a good part of his New Deal legislation. It was the passage he could be assured of, but not the U.S. Supreme Court. 
court's endorsement and upholding of the legitimacy and constitutionality of some of that statutory language. His attempt to pack the court backfired. And, Why is it a bad idea, Professor? Oh, my goodness, because I, I think uh, Steve, in, in my capacity as a political scientist and an astute observer of the court, that a court that is perceived as beholden to the will of the party in power loses so much of its legitimacy because, sure, to the extent that um, the Democrats regain control of the executive and legislative branch. Hypothetically, we don't know and, what's going to happen. And Go ahead. Of course, a pure hypothetical. And also in the banter and scuttle, but the talk about increasing the court's composition to 13 as a consequence Oof. to assure a democratically appointed majority, what happens the next election cycle when perhaps it's the other way and the Republicans, Republicans say, let's go to 16. Precisely. And where does it end? We need to assure that the court court is, is, maintains some presumption of independence, that it is not simply a vehicle, an instrument, a tool to serve the interests of the party in power. One, one more quick one, and we have about a minute left. Uh, Professor Paula Francisa from Seton Hall University uh, Law School, I need to ask you, we don't know what's going to happen with the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, but do you believe that literally weeks couple months, month before an election, it is appropriate to have that nominee put up before the Senate, or should the election be held, and then whomever wins, that person nominates the potential justice of the Supreme Court, or associate justice? Yeah, the problem is that any any diligent and and thorough answer to that question, Steve, as as we both know, uh, becomes tainted by the fierce partisanship and the accusations that are hurled on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the R is saying that the D's would have done it had the roles been switched. The D's saying, no, we didn't, putting forth Gar uh, Judge Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland, you stopped us right. last time and you said it was right. wrong and now it's right. right. But there was more time for Judge Garland. There's less time now. Yeah. And oh, my goodness. It, 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 real quick, before I let you go, how frustrating is this aspect of the discussion for you who loves the law? You love the yeah. law. This isn't and about law. It's about politics. Right. I, lo I love the law so deeply. I believe in its promise to bend that arc of justice towards rightness and equity and equality. Uh, mm. I, I treasure my role within the ranks of our noble profession, but I do fear for what is becoming of a national and civic discourse. We're seeing a devolution of the ethics of civility, and words matter. I, I believe that um, all of us as Americans, so proud of our great uh, ideals and aspirations, we're better than all of that. Yeah. Um, Professor Francisi, there's so much more to say. I assure you, you will be back, um, and we'll continue the conversation. Paula, my friend, for many years, uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you for all you do, Steve. Thanks, Paula. We'll be right back after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Gibbons PC, the Russell Berry Foundation, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Johnson & Johnson, MD Advantage Insurance Company, St. Joseph's Health, ADP, and by the Adler Aphasia Center. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Family Magazine and by CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. Being a kid is all about playing, laughing, and having fun. Doing what they do best, from rolling in leaves to building a snowman. But when illness or injury slows your little one down, you want the best pediatric care possible. Turn to the experts at the St. Joseph's Children's Hospital to get your superhero feeling super again. St. Joseph's Health, helping kids be kids.